Welcome, everybody. For those of you who are joining for the first time today, Third Path Institute is a national nonprofit celebrating over two decades of showing people how they can do work, family, and leadership differently, and why applying the science of work-life integration helps everyone work smarter. Did you know that over 100,000 people checked out our free resources last year, like the live and recorded versions of our Thursday webinars? We're glad you're here today. And as you will quickly discover, it's a celebration of everything that we know. So welcome, Roche. I think I say this every webinar, but this is really a profound and exciting webinar we're about to have. And that's because you've been doing groundbreaking research. And just because you are the person you are, I've had so many wonderful conversations with you. Um, I'm really excited about where we're going today. Just to give you a big picture as you're listening in today, Roche's done some great research, she'll talk about it in a little bit, that talks about how black professional moms have been thinking differently around work and family. And when I first read her book, which was super, super powerful, it made me think of shared care families in some ways. And last February, we had our first webinar with Roche where we talked about this. Today's webinar, we're going to go deeper, bigger, wider. It's going to be super exciting because I think we're going to start talking about why work-life integration should be an opportunity for everybody, but why it's also so stuck in so many ways. Um, and Roche is just the right person to have that conversation with. So Roche, welcome. There might be something you want to say before we talk a little bit about your book. Thank you. Thank you for having me again, Jessica. I really appreciate it. It's always such a joy to talk with you um, because, uh, quite frankly, you get it. <laughs> um, <many of> <laughs> that I'm trying to do with the book and presenting to la the lives of these women um, is, is, is exactly the kind of work that you're doing with Third Path Institute. And so I'm happy to continue these conversations. I don't want to spend too much time. Um, I think you did a great job of kind of introducing me and my work and uh, and the book. And so I want to go ahead and dig into the conversation, if that's OK. Great, great. Well, just for those who were not able to participate a year ago, you can find this webinar on our blog, uh, on our website. Um, you see the address down there on the bottom of our slide today. Um, and some of the takeaways that we talked about a year ago um, that I, you know, Roche was very patient with me when I had this obvious uh, ob observation. You know, I grew up in a household where my mom didn't work. My husband grew up in a household where his mom didn't work. I'm white. My husband is white. And I never really thought about that so many of the assumptions I was making was from my background. And so one of the first lessons that I learned re reading her wonderful book was such an obvious one, which is that, you know, many black mothers did not have that option. And there's a very large historical context there that we talked about um, a year ago. Um, and also something that I did know about, and certainly that I see with shared care families, is that they relied on a network of care. Um, certainly when Jeff and I were raising our kids, um, our network was critical to us being able to make it through. Um, something else we talked about, and this will come up today, is that you know black families were learning how to manage work basically in a racist world. And what that meant was, you know, they could not rely on that white, educated male's salary and protected job, that there was more of a possibility of them having unexpected dismissals or layoffs. And so that's something we're going to be talking about uh, a couple of times as we go through our conversation today and why that is so relevant to some of the things we're looking at today. What would you like to add about your book? I do have one other slide I put up there, I will be putting up there where I talk about some of the different ways that the, the mothers in your book uh, created a different portrait of black families. What else would you like to add? I think I, I love the way you did this modeling um, with this slide that talks about the, the ways I kind of framed how the black women that I interviewed for this project um, redefined their relationship with work. And um, I think maybe a couple things that I want to add to that um, is, is first of all, um, 
there's there's always been this idea that there's a dichotomy between uh, those women who engage in full-time work and those women who are uh, are stay at home. And um, and one of the things that I really tried to emphasize in the book was that it's it's not a dichotomous relationship that um, that women who are are employed full time outside the household are also doing the majority of the work at home, and women who um, particularly for the black families that I interviewed, the women who were um, you know quote unquote stay at home moms um, were still engaged in some. Uh, relationship with with paid work, or if it wasn't paid work, it was um, with an emphasis on uh, maintaining maintaining some of those work related skills. And then yeah. you had the the women who were kind of in the middle, who were engaging in this flexible space. And that's why I really tried to disrupt this idea of dichotomy, um, because these women were. You know, try, basically, they were the ones who were, you know, quote unquote, doing it all, right? They were, yeah, they were, they were saying they were flex time or part time um, at work, but we know that there's no part time work. Um, there's no way to really balance out only doing fifty percent of the work that you're supposed to be doing, um, and then there's no way to do fifty percent of the work that you need to do at home to manage your, your family. Um, so, you know, that was one of the things that I, that I, I really wanted to emphasize um, because so much of the literature to date has created this dichotomous relationship between women who leave the home to work and those who stay at home to work. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of just, just hit on a bit and because of the, the context that we're in right now with the pandemic and the effect that it's having on on households, um, and it, it's something that I'm just starting to look into, and I'm thinking I'm I'm probably going to write a um, a more public facing piece about this. But the jobs report for December um, that that came out right, to to say how the United States did in terms of holding or adding jobs um, for the American people. Um, just recently, a report was released, I believe it was by CNN, that said um, women <clears throat> were the majority of uh, uh, jobs that, the, the majority of, of jobs that were lost in December um, were held by women. And it was something around 140,000 jobs. Yes. Um, and so this is one of those quiet, um, influencers on women's decisions around work and family that you you mentioned in that last slide in terms of the precarity that families find themselves in yes. when, their, when their jobs aren't stable. But this pandemic has really wreaked some havoc um, on families. And I was just struck by the fact that, it, that, the, that the jobs that were lost, overwhelmingly majority were, were um, held by women, and we know from some of the other reports that have been coming out this this past year as it involved the pandemic that um, that those in the most precarious positions tended to be uh, women of color, black women, Latino yes. women, um, and then also uh, working class women. And I was talking to my son about this last night. Um, he was senior, and one of them. I have twin boys. And, I was talking to one of them last night, he's a senior in high school, and I was telling him about the job report because he's very interested in economics and business administration and things of that nature. And he, he was dumbfounded when I told him that he just looked at me like, what? Like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. How's that even possible? That what? Yes. And I said, it's the industry, right? The industries that are primarily held by women were the ones that were hardest hit. Yes. Um, and so that adds, you know, some of the conversation that we it adds to some of the conversation that we need to be having about how um, families, uh, in particular, are making sense of uh, of the the work and family uh, divide. And yes. um, one of the other things that came up in that report, or not the report, but the the article that was that was discussing the report 
was um, was that there were some people saying, you know, quote unquote, women are leaving, right? The the workforce is that age old conversation about choosing to leave, right? Yes, um, right. And what we find when we peel back the layers of that sentiment is um, is there are so many push uh, push pull factors. Um, yes. for women who are navigating these these conversations so that yes. you know I was saying to my husband recently I had a I have a friend who um, recently started looking for uh, a new position because she felt that her uh, supervisor was um, was undermining her uh, her movement forward her ability to keep progressing Yes. And um, when we when we started peeling back what might have been having an effect on that, she's a single mom um, with a school age child who, when the pandemic hit, decided that instead of pushing forward and trying to do both, she decided that she would take some of her given earned leave time yep. um, to focus on getting her son set up with the new um the new ways of, of learning online and and yep. spending some time with him because she didn't she doesn't have a partner and it was just the two of them yes and what we've tried you know what we've kind of come up with this was a supervisor who had before this time been very supportive of her movement forward had you know put her up for promotions and things of that nature but we started thinking was maybe this time off maybe rub this supervisor the wrong way and the yes. supervisor maybe started to think this person isn't as committed as i would like yep. them to be to this role and i want to see if i can find some other folks that might be able to fill this role in the way i want it to be filled amen to that <laughs> <laughs> well, I think yes that's so nicely into some of the things that you and I have been talking about in terms of yes. overwork and yeah. people making decisions um, and and uh, an employer uh, setting up workplaces that are going to be useful um, yes. for people to be able to to utilize and, and enforce some of the boundaries that we all need. <laughs> yes, yes, and and and. Listeners, as you as you can already tell, Roche is full of incredible knowledge about all this. And my goal today is to help us walk through, I think, some of the most cutting edge ways of thinking about this um, and, and to leave you at the end with some ideas around what are some next steps you can personally take um, to combat some of these problems. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Thank you for, for laying the groundwork so well. Um, I want to point out a couple things, and then we're, we are going to quickly jump into this problem of overwork, um, mm -hmm. because that's what we're, you know, what we, what we can see is this problem of overwork contributes in, in many ways to a lot of inequality in society um, in so many different ways. But what I, what I want to just briefly say back that I heard Rache say that's worth underscoring, you know, is that, um, there isn't a dichotomy. This was the year for us all to find out there wasn't a dichotomy. You know, you're literally on a Zoom call and your kids walk into the room or your boss's <laughs> kids come and sit in their lap. Um, this was the year for us to realize that we are parents, uh, care, caregivers of aging parents. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we want to be community members. We want to be involved with protests, Black Lives Matter protests. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be involved in our communities. We are not just workers. We are people who have very rich lives, and we want to create a workplace that supports that. And and so what you know what what Roche was doing in her book was looking at some black mothers who were figuring out how to do things differently. I want I want to make sure we don't lose track of one reason why you looked at this set of moms. There was something they were doing that was very different than typical what we typically think of in the black community. They were really pushing up against something different around their marriages too. Do you mind speaking about that for a second? Because I think that's relevant as we move forward too. Yeah. Um, so when I when I first started looking at um, these moms, 
you know, this this was the kind of project that that found me. I wasn't actually looking for it. Yeah. Um, and I uh, I had just had my my uh, my first child, my daughter. I was taking her to, to story time at the local library. I encountered uh, a group of black women who were also at story time in the middle of the day, in the middle of the work week. Um, and I was in graduate school. So I was, you know, I was, I was interested in, you know, how it was that these women were at the library in the middle of the day. And they were clearly professional women. They had those, you know, those markers of, of uh, career even before I actually had conversations with them. And once I started at, you know, once we started, you know, having a network because we, we saw each other, you know, once or twice every week, um, I found that all of them were, were career women. They were all in what we would call professions. They had all graduated from college. They were all, they had all, they all had advanced degrees and <clears throat> they were taking time all from work, and it wasn't just maternity leave. It was um, a, a concerted, concentrated amount of time, um, and and in many cases with no definite end date. And um, and this was this this had been in my uh, understanding of Black women's relationship with work. This had this was not um, a familiar practice. For me, and um, the women that I did know of who had been, you know, quote unquote, at home moms, um, hadn't necessarily been professionals. Right? They had been women who, over the history of the Black community, um, you know, because uh, women have tried to engage both work and child care at the same time, often took in work that they could do at home. Um, you know, so we have the history of laundry women, we have the, the history of, of bookkeepers and accountants who worked from home, um, who were who were managing uh, child care and household responsibilities, while being in many ways protected from, uh, you know, the racism that might take place uh, in in the context of working outside the home. And this was yeah. this was very important for um, for black men, particularly those of means, to be able to, you know, quote unquote, protect their their women um, from these types of uh, you know acts of of you know what what really amounts to violence. Um, but what was also going on with these women um, was, and I, it took me some time to get to this in my conversations with them. But I also knew that there was a history of, and we can see it play out in our statistical knowledge of black family life. There had been a pattern of, of uh, a female headed households um, in some of the history of the black experience, um, tending more towards working class families, but, but also um, there was some, um, some of that taking place also in what we might think of as middle class families, so the less less often, less so. Um, but what came of that was a kind of a collective memory that um, that black men uh, may not continue to be in the household over time, and in many instances, if they were in the household, their uh, their relationship with work weren't as stable as black women over time. So black women would, would be able to get more stable work, although it may pay less, they could hold on to employment longer than black men. So when you have this collective memory of black men not being present, and also when present, not having um, reliable, stable work, um, you get a response out of that memory that says black women need to be able to take care of themselves and their children. And that is something that gets passed down from generation to generation. So that was how I was raised in the women that I talked to for my study, that was how they were raised overwhelmingly. There was not one woman in the study who said they were, they were raised to expect 
to be taken care of by a man or to not have to work and take care of their of their children um, and, and also extended family if necessary. So that was the other thing that was quite new, right, for, for my yep. study was talking with these women and finding that not only were they at home taking a break from work and they were clearly career women um, with, you know, very, you know, capability of very high salaries, they were foregoing that those very high salaries, putting the education and advancement that they had been raised to achieve to the side to focus on, as they said, uh, their marriages and their children. And this was very new, this focus on marriage that, um, that uh, received a lot of pushback from the women's um, family members, particularly their mothers and grandmothers, so that they were act actively, uh, act actually and actively um, challenging them. Their mothers and grandmothers were actively challenging them on the decision to be, uh, to be at home. Um, and this extended beyond the women that I met at I also interviewed women um, through a methodology, a qualitative methodology that we call snowballing, um, where I met women in, in different contexts who were who were making similar decisions and experiencing similar pushback. And um, and so there's a what I suggest in the book is that um, for this particular class of women. Um, under these particular circumstances, there has been what we might think of as a shift in thinking, even if it's not always actualized, there's a shift in thinking toward prioritizing the marriage and the child unit um, over, often over, the, um, the relationship that Black women have traditionally had with their extended female kin where they knew that they could rely on that support much more often than that which could be supplied by their husbands right. um, and their and their partners. Um, this is a very huge shift. Um, and when I talk with people about it, when I present this literature, you know, I get the the head nod of recognition that that these types of negotiations are happening, but I also get the question of what are they thinking, right? So, right, <laughs> so right. The pushback, even in uh, in in recognition, right, which I talk about in the book as a degree of ambivalence, of a not actually being very sure. Um, because there haven't been models in this area for Black women of how this is all going to turn out. It actually ends up being somewhat of an experiment. Um, right. And I've kept in touch with a lot of the women that I talked with in the book, and there there has been um, there has been shifts back. Many of them having to do with the economy, you know, shifts in. Yep. Uh, their husbands, like just as we just as we discussed, right? The shift yep. in um, their husband's ability to keep making the amount of money they had been making. Um, there have been divorces. Um, there, you know, so the, the the very things that their their mothers and grandmothers and and other community members, as I've been sharing this work, um, talked about. They many of them have actually experienced, um, yeah. and so that ends up being, you know, something that we we have to to keep an eye on on too when um, when we're talking about the ways that Black women have relied on. And it, it's something that I call Black strategic mothering. It's this history of finding various ways um, over time in which to address the needs of the children first and then the rest of the community um, with personal um, success 
often coming last. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, and so you know, in that case or in those cases, what um, what we're finding, you know, as I talk about in the book, this idea of like strategic mothering is something that 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 I've I've coined as a conceptual tool, but it's something that Black women have been doing since you know they they came, they were forced onto the shores of the Americas. Um, this way of taking care of self and community, Angela Davis talks about it very wisely in an article called Black Women in the Community of Slaves. And, and it's this history of always figuring out best practices for how to take care of children first, community second, and everybody else um, third. Um, and yeah. so that means changing the relationship with work over time, over the life course, um, to, to make sure that it, that the, the family is and the community are taken care of first. Um, yeah. Well, I, you, 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 again, you've raised so many good points and I'm going to just uh, put one point out there and then we're going to go to start talking about how this all connects to overwork. Because, okay. you know, obviously, you know, you know, third pass work and really this flexible career idea is the one we've been trying to advocate for a long time because basically we've been saying, you know, we want to create gender equity where um, men and women can both succeed at work, but we also want to have families well cared for. And so mm -hmm. having this approach where both men and women can think together about how they both can flex their work. Um, is is obviously uh, one way to kind of create this this solution, this you know strategic parenting, um, so mm -hmm. that we can kind of create these healthier families. One of the things we laughed about, and again, I want to go on to our next slide, is this little mm -hmm. part at the top is the idea that family systems are working to create a little bit of cushion time, some recharge time, in the solution that they are creating. And you know, as we've gone through this pandemic. I mean, this has been pretty hard to create is recharge time. Mm -hmm. um, but it is something that, you know, what we do at Third Pass is try to say to families, look, men can redesign their work. Women can redesign their work. We can create these more flexible approaches. But what you're going to hear Rache and me talk about is flexibility is awesome. But what about affordability? What about risk? Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to start mm -hmm. getting at next. In particular, we're going to be talking about professional careers here because we believe that what leaders do in organizations has a huge impact on what everybody else can do. So it doesn't mean they're the only important people, professional people, but there's a logic of looking at professional careers as a way to make change for more people. So I'm mm -hmm. going to go through this couple of slides um, quickly, um, get your thoughts so we can get to the more complex issues. Um, one of my very favorite articles is by Claire Kane Miller. Um, it came out uh, last April. Um, you should look it up, everybody who's listening in today. Um, it talks about this crazy truth that for the first time in history, people who overwork make a lot more money. So up until 1995, mm -hmm. you can see where the graph charts, the, ch the changes in the, on the graph, you, you would work more hours and not get paid more because the hours you worked didn't increase your pay, they just increased the hours. But now mm -hmm. there's a premium for people who overwork. And this is connected to this problem and phenomena happening in professional careers. So if you read Claire Kane Miller's article, you'll see this is contributing. If you've got one person who's got this enormous hours job where they can earn a lot more money and another person you know, the family still has family responsibilities and the other person's going to accommodate that job. You both mm -hmm. can't be doing work 24 um, seven. I do want to get to some other issues around that contribute to overwork, but I, I wanted to put that on the, on the table because again, your families were dealing with some of these same problems and added to that mm -hmm. some, you know, some truths around how racism would play out in these families. So, mm -hmm. There was risk involved with anybody putting some limits around work and perhaps benefits, especially for some white men, <laughs> around overworking. Anything mm -hmm. you want to add about this briefly before we go on to the next slide? Yeah, just, you know, that, that showed up 
over and over and over again with the women that yeah. I was talking with, um, where, you know, and it goes back to what I mentioned earlier about the push factor, push pull factors. Yes. Um, they, you know, there were, there were several women who talked about how, you know, the, they both, both partners couldn't be traveling. Both partners couldn't be, um, you know, putting in an exorbitant amount of hours. Um, there was one family where the wife pulled back because the husband was in an industry where overwork was very easy. He had developed a stress-related uh, illness. And in order for, he, he, was, he was, of course, the primary uh, breadwinner, even though she, um, she was a professional as well, he was making much more in salary than her. And so it made more sense for her to pull out and focus completely on making sure that he was well taken care of yep. um, so that so that the stress of his job wouldn't overtake him. And she would manage, of course, the children and their education and the household management. Right. So, yeah. you know, another example of how these things play out. Um, in real life people's um, world. Yes, yes. And, and the punchline, folks, as you're listening in, is that overwork is actually really, really bad for organizations. There's a whole bunch of consequences from chronic overwork that creates problems in organizations. And we're going to get to that because just because you're working long hours doesn't mean you're working the best hours. But what I wanted to get to was, you know, we had a webinar right before the pandemic hit that talked about this phenomena of people just putting all their eggs in one basket of work. And there's even a phrase out there called workism, where people were just, you know, really thinking that work was the best thing and the only thing we wanted to invest in, as opposed to, you know, working one part of our lives and caregiving being another important part of our lives. So I, I put up some of these um, things in here that it, Talk about what contribute to overwork. And, you know, of course, what we've been talking about so far is this idea that, you know, many of us in professional careers work in organizations where work first, where you put work first in your entire career means you're going to get a better reward, uh, whether that's the bonus, that's, you know, the promotion, whether you're going to not get the pink slip. Um, and so, you know, uh, that's one of the things we've talked about that contributes to overwork. You know, I put up some other ones here. Um, you started off, um, you know, we, we were all probably working hard and still are working hard because we're afraid that we might not have a job. Mm -hmm. um, and that, mm -hmm. that certainly makes things uh, pretty challenging. Um, but one of the things we talked about, you know, on the, on the workism call was that, you know, people maybe even start identifying more from their work than caregiving. I mean, think about it. Mm -hmm. The value of care in society is not super highly valued. So when people mm -hmm. are saying to put boundaries at work but to create time for care, um, that's not really what the world says is the best way to use your time. What mm -hmm. else would you add that contributes to this problem of you know, people, the propensity to overwork that maybe isn't listed here or I haven't talked about yet? Um, I, I, I hate to say I think you covered them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, you know, when I'm looking at each of the, of the, the circles in your diagram, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing, you know, everything that I think of, I think, oh yeah, that's covered there, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I think those are definitely key things. Are there are there other things that have come up in your conversation? That I think I think the one I want to talk about, and and maybe it, just because it's there, I, it's worth still talking about, is I think part of this problem is that we just live in a world where everything can happen instantly, and yeah. so. I, I want to give a story here that I think gives some context to this because, you know, third pass been around for 20 years. I encourage myself and my staff to have time for life alongside work. And, you know, our goal is to, to get a book out about what we've been learning for the last 20 years 
And in, there's one chapter in the book that will be talking about impossible jobs. And the truth is, I was chronically overworked for a while, but I'm somebody who's got good skills to not overwork. I've got support from my board not to overwork. I've got staff who is, you know, supported to think with me about how not to overwork. And so some of it, I think, is it's just very hard in a world where everything's happening fast mm -hmm. to, we, we, even in a supportive workplace, with a supportive boss, with excellent skills, there, I think there is a propensity to overwork. I think there's an anecdote to that, but I wonder if you think just the fact that we're all living in this 24 seven world, even with good skills and good organizations, it's still challenging. Would you agree, Roche? Definitely. I mean, as you were speaking, I was thinking about what do I, what is the thing that I most often have to put boundaries around? And it's email. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because things can just and come in. Yeah. It, I mean, anytime, what email? Rep anytime. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it could be that you get that email that day that was nothing on your plate that you were even going to think about, but it's this fabulous idea. And so every day you're being, asked, do you want to get involved with this new thing, this new mm -hmm. idea, this new possibility, and it can mm -hmm. come in 24 seven. And it's very hard to think about this, yeah. you know? Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. where I want to go with that is it's, I think we need to think big picture that there is some mm -hmm. really big phenomena that are causing problems that we need to really address, create different career paths, you know, create more of a secure, uh, you know, we're talking about professional families who hopefully have some, you know, safety nets and, you know, savings, but, you know, we really need to create some better policies that help all people. But I also think what I'm trying to get at, what we'll get at is it's a new world where we need to get smarter about setting limits. So I'm going to tell you my okay. quick little story and then we're going to go on to the next slide. I learned in the pandemic that I had to start, um, I, I now have a, uh, an, em an empty nester. So the normal work week used to include a rhythm where I'd hang out with my kids a couple afternoons a week. Mm -hmm. My other husband would ha hang out with them a couple afternoons a week. As an empty nester, I was noticing that my work was just taking up all week long, all of my mental mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. And I said, Jessica, this is not what you want to do. So I, I haven't succeeded yet. I have failed more than I've succeeded, but I've <laughs> tried to start taking Wednesdays mornings to myself mm. just to create some space in the week mm -hmm. where I'm not just thinking about work from Monday through Friday. Instead, I'm thinking about other things I care about. And I think, I think that that's why shared care parents are so successful is that they've got work and something else and they've gotten very good at kind of setting up a rhythm around that mm -hmm. where if we don't do that, work just takes over our lives. Obviously, there's more complications than that, but what, what do you think about that? I think that's definitely true, um, that there, there have to be some ways in which we, uh, as workers, um, you know, try to set aside some time for ourselves. Um, kind of going back to the, to the battery imagery you had on yep. the previous slide. Um, where that, that green shading is, is where yep. you're really trying to recharge. Yep. I do worry though, um, and I know we're intentionally focused on professional families because, you know, part of the idea is that if we can, can change the way we're engaging with work, we can change some things that are happening for people who are in more precarious work situations. Yes. But it, I think it's, incredibly hard for people who are in precarious situations to think about carving out time for themselves. And I, yes. I remember when I first started doing research on work and family, I remember being in this, uh, in this research and writing group where I thought, you know, because I was doing research on professional families, I said, hey, you guys, you know, what if we change this? We're talking about policy. We're talking about policy in the U.S. and also abroad. Because um, there were some people in our research group who were looking at European models um, and just trying to think about, you know, what are some of the policy possibilities. Yes. And yes. I remember saying to them, you know, in my just out of grad school naivete, 
Um, <laughs> what if we fix everything for professional families and then we can take the model for professional families and, and you know, translate it to working class and, and more precarious folks? And, you know, and what I got back gently but sternly <laughs> was yep. the, the history of work yes. history tells us that we have to foreground the experiences of people who um, don't have that social, political, economic capital to be able to make these changes for themselves, or we need to align ourselves with their interests um, so that we can be of use to them, so that we benefit from the least of these, right? If we take yes. care of the least of these, then we'll be able to do better for everyone. Yeah, um, yeah. I've been, well, I've been thinking about, you know, that kind of model, right? Yes. What does that look like? And especially with the pandemic, it just seems so, so difficult to yes. do these things out. Well, you know, again, you've raised the, exactly where we want to go. That's, that is our last slide, folks. We want to get to a point where we start talking about what would public policy look like to really support everybody to think about that. But we're, we're going to take a little bit of another path for a minute now about why I get hopeful. And again, I hope not naively hopeful. Because <laughs> I do think when you, not, not to dis, um, disregard what Roche is talking about, we need a solution that works for everybody, including families in a precarious situation, period. End of story. That's what we need. And we're going to talk about that. But I do think one thing that's shifted that's totally different because of in, uh, the, the good side of technology is that mm -hmm. in professional families, we now have a model of how you can move into leadership and have a life. And by the way, if you're listening in, you haven't heard this already, you can go to our website and you can download this amazing resource that will show you professional families who've been able to move ahead and create time for life. And it will show you this is not a unicorn. This is happening right now. There are professional families who are moving ahead in their careers and creating time for life. And the big message in that resource that is free for you is that men can redesign their jobs just like women. But here we go back to the very first slide that Roche and I were talking about. Maybe there's more risk for different people to do this than others. And we have mm -hmm. to pay attention to this. But let's not forget the fact that men can redesign their jobs. And we want to talk about, you know, what does it look like in a family where both are setting boundaries around work so they have time for life and what's that risk involved with that in professional careers so we want to get to that but before we get there you can find a story about cj on our website and he's a dad who wanted to flex his job to, to go to four days of work so he could care for his kids on that fifth day you can find all this information on our resource interestingly cj just got in touch with me about a month ago Oh, this is a slide telling you that CJ learned all kinds of great skills. In fact, in the CJ case study, he talks specifically about how he learned how to create quiet time so he could do focus work, um, super useful for him and his organization. But here's the punchline. A month ago, CJ contacted me, and basically, he's been groomed to move ahead in his organization, take on more of a leadership role, and he's trying to keep to that four-day work schedule. And he's finding mm -hmm. it really challenging. Mm -hmm. And so what I, why I wanted to get to this slide is because this is the, this is the crossroad that's going to mm -hmm. keep on keeping the problem going. One of the crossroads, sorry. One of the crossroads mm -hmm. is going to keep it keeping going. And it's a crossroad. Those who are listening in today, we can do this differently right now. Because I think the more of us who say, hey, I want to move ahead in a professional career and I want to have a life and I'm doing a better job when I do this for myself and my organization, that you know, we can normalize that to move into a position of leadership doesn't require people to give up their lives. And here's the punchline. And I've told Rishay this punchline once before. 
What I've seen mm-hmm. over the pen, oh, what I saw over the pandemic is all those progressive leaders who are part of the third path community who went through this last year, they were smarter in how they handled everybody in their organization. They were thoughtful. They knew that you had a life. They'd been there themselves. Mm-hmm. They were leaders who got it. They wanted to get through the pandemic, helping people have time for their life and be able to be successful at work. I saw it over and over again. And so what I think is the hopeful message here is when you support professionals to do this differently, like those amazing women in your book, they're Mm -hmm. gonna be very different leaders. And they're gonna support others around them in their workplaces to have whole lives as they get through work and family because they did it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so as much as it might feel like there's other things you need to focus on. Helping leaders do things differently, like what the women in your or book were doing, like the shared care families we know, they're creating a different kind of leader who's going to create a different kind of workplace. Am I being a Pollyanna when I say this, Rache? <laughs> <laughs> I, so, so, so for, the, for the population that we're talking about, no. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I, I think I've seen this play itself out since the pandemic happened, right? Because you have you have a situation now where men and women, um, and it, and even same sex couples, right, are in the household yep. together, managing the kids and managing work and negotiating how to do all of that at the same time. Yeah. Um, and so I've seen things, you know, on Zoom uh, meetings that would never have happened um, with in-person meetings. You know, when yep. we used to have faculty meetings in person, you would get to a point around, you know, five o'clock or so, where if the meeting was going a little long, faculty would start leaving because they have to go pick up their kids from, from child care. Now that we're on uh, Zoom, on remote, um, you know, these remote channels, where we have our faculty meeting, um, there is a clear shift by the leadership who are leading the meeting that is more intentional, more engaged in the fact that people are having to get their kids ready for dinner or having yep. to go cook dinner or having to, right? Because when we were in person, it was either someone else is doing that for you or you have to leave early. You or your own, the individual, have to leave early to go take care of those requirements. Yes. Now that we're in this remote setting, no, it's everyone is, everyone is present and everyone is engaged while also doing other things because that has become the norm. And so the leadership has to be much more intentional about making sure that they are attentive to the needs of those folks who are having to manage it all at the same time. Yes. So definitely, I think definitely, because we've all had to make these adjustments, and you know, some some more than others for different reasons than others, they definitely, much more attention to the ways in which this shows up in people's real lives. I think you're absolutely yeah. right. And the yeah. leadership is being forced to, and people are being real, real vocal about it too. Right? Yep. <laughs> We're in yep. meetings sometimes and people are like, uh, no, this meeting cannot go over time because yep. I've been on Zoom all day. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I need to go get dinner for my kids. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, true. yeah. And again, I I don't say that suddenly the world is going to be an easy place. Um, and I want to talk about Tanya in a second. Um, but uh, you know, I do feel some hope when I see the progressive leaders in the third path community really approaching the pandemic so differently. I'm not saying any of them are having an easy time, nor their employees, but they are just a little bit more creative, a little bit more flexible, a little mm-hmm. bit more thoughtful 
in a way that I think is the future of what we can create for organizations. Um, and they're not going to snap back to the old ways. They're looking ahead and saying, how can we hold on to what's good about these remote work and this greater flexibility um, in a way that is very inspiring. And for those of you who are listening in, you'll get to meet Tanya on the February webinar. But I wanted to put her picture up today just to remind you that this is not just a work family or work caregiving issue. When Tanya joins us in February, she'll be talking about the journey she's been on to create time for her life as someone who's not a parent, but just someone who wanted to create a richer, broader spectrum of things she was involved with. This is mm -hmm. an everybody issue. We can really keep on reaching for a world where people have time for work, time for the things they care about, time to recharge, and where we want to get to is how can we do this for everybody? And we're running out of time, so I won't talk a lot about this, but one of the things that Tanya will be talking about is how she was part of our overwhelm integration groups, and that's where we teach people some of these um, integration skills so that they can follow these ideas. Um, and we will be starting a couple of OMG groups this spring if you want to learn more. All right, so there's a lot of things that are causing us to overwork. There are some skills Tanya and others like CJ learned to set some better boundaries and have some time for both work and life. As we move in our head in our careers, it's often the problem that work seems to want to take over. But when it doesn't, we create a different kind of leader. I'm starting to see that these leaders might be the future of how we can create a better kind of organization. Um, but it's not just organizational policy that needs to change. It's also public policy. And we need to start really imagining how can we make this more possible for everybody. So we're at the point in the call where I'm sure Rache will have some ideas that she wants to share about this slide and how we need to be thinking smarter about what would the future look like around organizational policy and public policy. But we're also at a point in the, in the uh, webinar where we have a bunch of really smart people who are listening in today. And they might have a, sh a story they want to share that helps illustrate something or a question they want to ask. And so Sergio, this would be a good time for you to start checking that out the chat, seeing if there's some questions or comments that we should add into today's discussion. Um, bottom line, we do need public policy that supports everybody, especially families in a precarious situation. Those words that Roche used that are so, so profound and so important. We need families well cared for to create a better society. And, and just organizational policy, just families solving it by themselves is not going to work. We need good public policy too. I want to get your thoughts about this, Roche. I want to say one last thing, and then we'll see if Sergio has some questions from our audience or thoughts from our audience. Mm -hmm. I, love, I love Kristen Mashka's quote. Um, we've had Kristen on one of our, our webinars. She wrote a great book. I highly recommend it too. Her point is that sometimes we, we can't invent good public policy because we're still inventing public policy from the old assumptions. Women are caregivers, not men. Not the new assumptions. Men can be caregivers, just like women. We can flex our jobs. We don't have to work full time or nothing. Um, and so some of it is that we're at a place as a society where we can't imagine the better solutions yet, I would argue, because there's not enough of us enacting these better solutions that doesn't diminish the point that we need better public policy. What are your thoughts about all this? You're a wise person. What would you add to this conversation so far? I, um, I love the idea that they're going to be, as you presented on this last slide, um, differences over the course of the life course. It's one of the things that I, um, that I found uh, when working with the women that I was talking with as well. Um, that that there you you need different things at different points uh, of the life yes. course, <clears throat> and I think speaking to what you were saying about really relying on old models, I think that's true even in terms of thinking about the life course. We're still operating from a from a perspective that people are going to retire at sixty five. Right. Um, <laughs> and, that ain't happening. Uh, <laughs> it's not happening. There are lots of reasons yeah. it's not happening, but yep. um, but it's important for us to recognize um, people are having kids a little later. 
uh, you have multiple generations right now. I have my grandmother, my mother, myself, and my kids um, yes. who I'm engaged in caregiving for, right? Yep. Um, so we have a lot more of that happening as well, these multiple generations. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to make things work for everyone. But I don't want to, I don't want to talk too long, but I think, I think this, this last piece is, is just really spot on in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, we have so much work to do to figure this out and, you know, and third path here for the long run to try to figure this out. Um, but I do think it, uh, it makes me hopeful to start seeing a different kind of leader create a different kind of organization as one possible place we're going to make some change and obviously the, the the number of men we've seen much more engaged in caregiving makes a huge difference and the visibility and the importance of caregiving makes a big difference Sergio mm -hmm. as you look at the questions that are out there or comments is there any that are worth kind of bringing to the surface right now no questions today <laughs> oh, <wow>. really oh. <laughs> ah, wait, we, wait we might have just got one it looks like is that possible I see a little question thing on my screen. I'm not good at figuring those things out. Maybe there's one on your too, Sergio. Yeah, um, they just they just posted a question. So this is a great question. It's a long question. <laughs> I am going to read it. It just got in. So great. it says, great. thank you for your important scholarship, Dr. Barnes. I'd love to hear more, more about what you learn, how the black mothers you observe rely on each other as they engage the experiment on an engaging way of life, they, their elders maybe didn't understand or caution against. What strategies did they use? How did they understand their network as a resource, not just for logical support, but also normalizing this new way of being? Mm, that's a great question. Wow. That's a really, really, really good question. Um, yeah, they, um, they were trying to to create ways of, of normalizing, um, you know, some of the decisions that they were making um, around integrating their families, and definitely trying to make an impact um, in the ways their 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 elders, their mothers and grandmothers, and other members of the community were 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 you know pushing back on their decisions. I think the primary way that they were they were doing this was by creating support groups for for each other, um, creating networks of support that weren't just about taking care of the kids, but were also about um, creating networks where they could talk to one another um, about their experiences, about um, the decisions that they were making, challenges that they were having as a result of the decisions that they were making. And I think that was really huge. And I think one of the things that I that I talk about in the book is how that that even harkens back to some of the practices, um, the historic practices of Black women. Um, there was a period in the early 20th century where Black women developed um, these groups that were called um, Black women's clubs. They had lots of different clubs in different cities, um, and it would be Black women getting together often at churches or in each other's homes where they would uh, they would organize talk to one another about the things that they were encountering and also organize right around some of the things that were most important to them at the time and a lot of it had to do with policies um, that were impacting black communities at that time and so one of the things that I saw with these women was a and was a, a redevelopment of these some of some of these ideas and some of these ways of supporting one another. Um, hmm. And they were attentive to um, this idea of of <clears throat> making an impact on the precarity of their decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But they didn't necessarily. Um, and as the you know, as the the researcher, I can't really direct direct them in particular pathways. <laughs> but, um, right. They weren't necessarily connecting it to overall you know, policy implications or, you know, organizing in a way that was going to strategize for change per se. But I think what they were doing was 
um, was organizing in a way that provided support for one another. And I think that that made it easier for women to make the decision. And I think, um, you know, part of what's happened with the book when I have presented it in different spaces, um, I think, you know, it, it, it's creating a space where Black women are able to say, oh, I hadn't thought about this as a possibility for myself. How can I make this work? Um, but it, it is challenging because, you know, even as um, we've been talking about, Jessica, part of what happens um, is if you can't figure out how to relate it to policy, you it ends up being in the, an individual level um, change, and that's not necessarily sustainable, right? We've got to figure out a way to make these individual changes um, connect to policy. Yeah, yes, we do, we do. And, uh, and I think the more people who are kind of reaching out for this different approach and finding a network of support around that different approach, they, they will lean towards uh, seeing bigger ideas. Um, certainly one, one parallel group out there that's been doing this is the, the fatherhood community. There's been this amazing networking and connecting and thinking together about how to really redefine fatherhood and what does policy change need to look like and paternity leave need to look like uh, to create more supportive uh, situations for fathers too. We are mm -hmm. almost completely out of time. It doesn't mean there isn't <laughs> one more question out there. Is there uh, if it's a quick question, we might be able to take it, Sergio. Um, I, if somebody has to get off the call, please do. Um, is there one last question for Rache out there? No more questions. Ah, look at that. Thank you, cooperative audience. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am so, so, so glad you are here today, Rache. And again, if you want to hear more about this, join us in February because really the person who invented this concept that Rache's moms are doing in her book, this integrated approach to work and family, is Lottie Balin. And mm -hmm. uh, we will be we will be celebrating her work in February with some really profound and powerful stories, including Tanya's. So please, please, please come back in February. Thank you, Rache. Is there one last word you want to say before we wrap it up? Yeah, I think if there, there are any folks who had questions that we didn't have time to or you were still formulating your questions, feel free to email me. I'm um, at Mount Holyoke College, and you can just plug in my name and the college, and I'll pop right up, and you can email me. Wonderful. Thank you for that offer. And, you know, again, for those who are listening in today, thank you so much. You'll find a bunch of free resources on our website, and don't forget to follow us on social media. Thanks again for being here today.